And away we go. The Alberta Teachers Association acknowledges Treaty 4, 6, 7, 8, and 10 territories within Alberta. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations, including the many places you are joining from today. We're grateful for their traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. Our recognition of this land is an act of reconciliation and an expression of our gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. It is my great honor today to do a kind of homecoming for uh, five members of the Black Teachers Association. Uh, it's been a long uh, 10 months uh, going from two members, uh, Sarah and Andrew, uh, to uh, must be well over 50 now. And there's a whole bunch of allies and fans in the room right now. So uh, we have nothing but time this afternoon for a presentation from uh, Sarah, Gail, uh, Patrick, Matthew, and Andrew from the Black Teachers Association. Uh, so why don't you folks take it away? Perfect. I'm going to share my screen at this time and get this party started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's a beautiful day in the capital city. And my name is Sarah Adamako Ensa. Um, with me, I have Andrew, Gail, Matthew, and Patrick. And we're going to talk to you today about amplifying black voices. Now this first little bit, um, Andrew and I are going to chat with you about how we started this entire process and what it's looked like back in June. So I'm going to let Andrew take it away first. And you know what, <clears throat> first of all, um, thank you to everybody um, for being here today. I'm going to extend my thanks after my little spiel because I wanted to change my presentation a little bit today. A number of you have been to a few of our presentations already, and I wanted to share a poem um, that I was inspired to write um, because of a connection I had with um, the School of Black Students Association and the stuff that kind of wrote was speaking to how they felt. And I hope to God Zoom doesn't destroy my speaker because I want to try and do this one shot. So the poem is called Getka. And it starts like this. It seems like education has been driving on the highway, no sleep, no stops, no gas, but still driving. It seems like the people on the inside of the car are comfortably lounging while driving when the other passengers, you know, the ones not even on the inside, they're holding on the back of the trunk, legs running fast at 100 miles an hour. Still, when we get to the destination, exhausted, forward facing, other passengers call us complacent as if our situations were adjacent. G-A-R, general aptitude replacement. This is coming live from my basement. Word to Amanda Gorman, but like Muhammad Foreman, it's Black History Month, but I'm black every morning. I don't give warning, but cameras are swarming. This is a speech, but I am not performing. We aren't activists, we're teachers. It's the black in us, our features. But who's backing us, not leaders? And now we're back in cuffs, no speakers. I'm not a black face looking for blank checks. I'm a black saint looking for long rest. Watching a print tie storming the Congress. Protesting the life where Breon slept. Asking the law, they saying it's wrong nest. And I'm the superintendent, sorry, wrong guest. Now I'm supposed to be quiet, song check. Respect to our queens, because all of our moms blessed. I've been conscious on this cons quest, hearing poets and you smiling. But when the brother from the island was rhyming, y'all was turning heads blind and see Simon says and said Simon. I'm more like Paul Simon, black ninja guiding ancestors under the water. Call me Black Poseidon. I'm not the leader, but I believe in guiding. Greater Edmonton Teachers Convention, and we're amplifying black voices. Um, my my introduction to this work was a speech at um in Edmonton at the Black Lives Matter protest I wasn't supposed to be there um but my students reached out and they asked me said Mr. P will you come and support us and all of you teachers here right now know that feeling when your teachers when your students ask you to do something outside of class when you really care about them it's not even a question it's not even a question you're going to help them so Sarah, without further ado, I guess we can get started with our presentation. So thank you all for being here. That was great, by the way. Bless you. <laughs> <sighs> so Black Teachers Association, how did it start? Sarah and I, um, she's a teacher in Edmonton Catholic schools. I'm a teacher in Edmonton Public Schools. Um, I'm male, she's female. 
we're both black and we wanted to see how we could bring about change we were tired of seeing things happening in society we had watched the police brutality in the united states of america we had our own experiences here in canada and we wanted to be a part of that change um and i'm very proud to say that this is the first ever get cut session i've ever ran in my entire life i've gone to teachers convention multiple times and every time that i've been there i've always hoped to connect with teachers that were kind of like me that had similar experiences and also to connect with the allies so i humbly thank every single person that's here in this meet because in many regards without you guys we wouldn't be here today there yeah, now when we decided to come up with this association we focused on five main pillars and you can see on the screen that they are representation communication inclusion and racism awareness providing support and network and bridges to post-secondary institutions now i'm going to let andrew do uh, the first one and we will alternate back and forth and tell, tell you a little bit more about each pillar excellent Number one is representation. And I said this just recently on um, the Ryan Jesperson show too as well, because I think it's important. Um, we're committed to the representation of African Canadians in schools and the curriculum and resources available to teachers in our province. We're committed to the inclusion of African Canadian voices, history and cultural understandings into all areas of education system in Alberta. We want to see our faces in the front of the classroom. We want to see our faces in the textbooks. We want to see our faces and hear our stories and the resources. And we definitely want to make sure that our students get those opportunities, guys, because once they see themselves in some positions, then they can believe that they can achieve and do anything within our education systems. The second one's communication. And communication is quite important because it allows us, like Andrew said, to reach out to one another, um, not just those of us in the room that are people of color, but reach out to everyone. And one of the pillars being communication, we were committed to providing a safe and informative place where educators that are Black and their allies can communicate with each other on a consistent basis. So we've established such a hub through both Instagram and Twitter, and we're branching out into more digital platforms, um, being able to be a voice for others, but also to have people lend their voices to us. Perfect which brings us to number three, which is inclusion and racism awareness. Now I have to say this for a number of teachers who are here in this meet, um, wouldn't it have been nice to have, you know, some inclusion and racism awareness, professional develop settings or ways for our administrators and teachers to deal with these concepts, given the political climate that we're living in. I mean, we've seen protests, we've seen counter protests in our city of Edmonton, and we think that racism awareness is very important. So we are committed to the inclusion of African Canadians and their culture, as well as racism and anti-racism awareness at all levels of education system in Alberta. Our committee of African Canadian teachers and allies will be encouraged and supported. This association will be an essential resource for African Canadian teachers and allies to finally demonstrate the importance and necessity of the voice of African Canadian educators and students in our schools. The fourth pillar is providing support. So that's something that I think we all do very well as educators naturally is um, to the people that are surrounding us, whether they are school staff, other teachers or students, we support one another. We're committed to supporting African Canadian teachers and students in their own schools and districts. We're also committed to establishing a liaison in schools um, within our province. Our communities, we feel, will greatly benefit by having a liaison in our schools that is a presence that's ready and accessible for all of our African Canadian teachers and students. Now, I know a lot of um, schools and, di and divisions and districts throughout Alberta have been able to solidify such a presence with our Indigenous learning. And it's so nice to be able to have consultants and liaisons in our schools um, that can lend that voice and that, that teaching and that knowledge to our Indigenous students and give them support. So in turn, we are looking to hopefully be able to create something similar for our students that are Black, whether it's African, Caribbean, um, however they identify in that realm. And finally, guys, the fifth pillar of the Black Teachers Association is networking and bridges to post-secondary institutions. And I, I get a little bit emotional now because I know we have our member, uh, or five of our members here in this presentation. And 
the five members who are here remember that very clearly in the beginning stages of the BTA, we always said that we wanted a present at teachers convention. And I have to thank our good friends at the ATA. So that's Dan and that's Jason Schilling and that's Heather Quinn for helping us at the very early stages of us even becoming association because we now have those opportunities for networking uh, such as GetCA. So we are committed to a solidified presence at the Greater Edmonton Teachers Convention, which we have now. Yes, yes. This is an annual event in our province and we'll now be it will now be a meeting place where allies and black teachers and education students can meet network and receive information related to African Canadian teachers in the field. Uh, they will also get to view our inclusion resources, meet with and communicate with African Canadian vendors such as myself, Sarah, Patrick and Matthew. Awesome. Now I'm going to take over a little bit and I'm going to talk about little people. I'm going to talk about elementary school. Um, I've been very lucky to work in the same school for the past eight years, the only eight years of my career thus far, and I've been teaching at St. Pius X, and it's a fantastic place to be. Um, I have taught in Div 1 and I've taught in Div 2, but right now I'm hanging out with the biggest of the littles, the grade sixes. And I believe personally that you can have this conversation with anyone, a conversation about race, diversity, anything in that nature that might be a little uncomfortable, you're able to do it with the youngest of the young. So the question that I'm posing to you at this moment is diversity, what is it? Very simply put, diversity is the state of being diverse. It means variety, it means difference. It means looking out into a crowd of students and seeing multiple different shades of people. The question that I've received, probably the, the, the hottest button question I've received is, should I be talking to my students about diversity and its strengths and challenges? The answer, of course, is yes. Now, students that are of color are often inundated with cultural figures through entertainment realms. They see themselves as the next LeBron James. They see themselves as the next Beyonce. But not all the time do they see themselves as the next astrophysicist or the next general surgeon or even the next teacher sometimes. A question that I'd like you to think about while you listen to my portion of this presentation is, why don't we see more diversity within our schools? I'm not talking about the kids, I'm talking about the big people, the adults that are within our buildings. Why don't we see a little more diversity within them? Now, I'm going to give you five tips for an elementary classroom. What's worked for me in my eight years of teaching? The first tip that I can give you is to create a safe space for students to question what you have to share. Now. As teachers, we share all the time. We share our knowledge, we share things that we've learned and share study skills, we share about sky science, we share about physics, but not all the time do we share about some of the things that make us uncomfortable. We don't often share about things that we've watched in the news that make us cringe. Students, as we know, are always wanting to share. They wanna hear their voices as much as we do. So it's important that you invite those students to share what they know. It's also really important that you're brave in sharing what you know. So if there's something on the news that makes you uncomfortable, it's okay to share that with them. It lends itself really well to current events and it allows your students to see that beyond the four walls of your classroom, you're also inundated with media and in turn want to talk about it and share about it. The second tip that I have for you is to allow discomfort and expressions of it. It's very okay to acknowledge what makes you uncomfortable. And I'm very much an advocate for an uncomfortable conversation. There's nothing wrong with them. That's how we grow. And it's important that your students see that you are also growing and that not everything is roses and sunshine and you are also uncomfortable with things. I remember specifically when there was everything happening at the Capitol back in January. And we had moved to remote learning um, for a week in elementary school. And my attendance question the morning after was, does pineapple belong on pizza? And as I'm going through the list, by the time I got to the fourth student, he had said, why are we talking about pizza and not about the Capitol? And it turned into the most authentic learning environment for social studies that morning. Students were able to express their, their discomfort and how scary it was and how big of a deal this was. And I was so proud to say that they are becoming better people by paying attention to the news and expressing the things in the news that they see that are a little bit uncomfortable. 
So that's my second tip for you. My third one is to acknowledge your own learning. Students can relate to being a learner and they will absolutely relate to you even more if they see that you as an adult are still learning. Sometimes it's a little mind blowing for them to think my 31 year old teacher is still learning things as well, but that's what they truly vibe with and that's what they really start to learn and respect is that everybody's a learner no matter how old. The fourth tip that I have for you is to allow all voices to be heard in this process. Now, as students are expressing their discomfort with things maybe surrounding race, it's important to allow their voice to be heard. Stifling things because you are uncomfortable doesn't quite help them learn to use their voice. And at the end of the day, what we want is for all students to be able to share what they know and be proud to share what they know. So by stifling voices, instead of amplifying them, it creates a hindrance and they lose a love of learning and a love of sharing when they're not able to share freely. Now, of course, as a teacher, you're going to use your professional judgment. Some things shouldn't be shared and don't encourage that. But certain things, and I'm sure you can understand what I'm referring to here, certain things we should be able to allow our students to completely um, share what they know and be proud of them when they do. My last tip is to celebrate the diversity around you. Um, the diversity meaning not just a poster or an assignment or a worksheet. I mean, I mean to truly celebrate the diversity that's around you. I'm going to tell you a very quick story about Multicultural Day at my school, St. Pius X. And um, I know some people cringe about a Multicultural Day. I personally think they're so much fun. And our school, it's completely exploded. It's such a big event at St. Pius. And, um, there was one year, I believe it was two years ago, um, we had our head custodian. He was doing his thing, doing a great job as he always does. And um, at the end of the day in the gym or I should say in the afternoon, we have kind of our talent show portion. So students are able to come and show us a song from their culture, a dance, um, whatever they want to showcase their culture. And our head custodian um, decided to sing. And he is from East Africa, from Eritrea, and we had uh, some students as well from Eritrea, so they joined him. And it went from him and five of my students up on the gym stage to nearly half of our school celebrating in a song that they didn't know the words to. And it was students of all nations that got up and joined in that moment. And it was so special because our head custodian is a quieter man. He's someone that does his job and does it well, interacts with the kids here and there, but to see him on that spotlight and have the kids join him, completely engulf him with love was just the most incredible thing to see. That's what I mean by celebrating diversity. Now, the truth about amplifying our young voices, it's twofold. There's impact behind it and it changes the way that we serve our children each day but it's also a bit inspirational. Students then are encouraged to reach beyond what they might perceive to be their best, and it will help them to challenge themselves to go even further. Now, with all that being said, I'm going to pass it on to Gail, who's going to talk about the same race role model. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, so because I'm getting this opportunity, I have to send some love out to my Lillian Osborne family, but most importantly, my Lillian Osborne social studies team. So um, just a little shout out to you all. And also just something I picked up on, a uh, fantastic question came through the chat and I feel it's super important to actually address it right now. It was a question about whether uh, we should actually, or what's the difference between taking a look at African Black, or excuse me, African Canadian versus Black Canadian. What I would say to you is if you look at uh, the community as the African Canadian community, it allows for us to promote the positivity of Afrocentricity. We look at it as the Black Canadian community, there's nothing wrong with that. However, it's more of a confinement to the construct of race. Both are acceptable, but one affords Black people a lot more pride, and that is African Canadian. So I just picked up on that, and I hope you don't mind me diverting slightly and just sharing that. I'm here today to talk about the absence of the same race role model, which is the pillar based on representation. And I really want us to spend some time immersing in this idea. And I want to start by asking you to think about who your students see and who they have seen throughout their entire education. And I want you to think about what it would be like to walk into a room 
and see no one that looks like you. I want you to visualize yourself now, getting away. We, so many of us think about what it would be like to open a school far away, um, someplace else. And I wanna ask you to just take that trip in your mind and think about what it would be like to walk into a community, walk into a culture that you were not familiar with. Now imagine yourself being at the front of the classroom there, teaching students that don't look like you, that you are not as familiar with. And I want you to ask yourself how you would create the same questions or pose the same questions that you ask in your classroom today. I want you to think about what kinds of questions about culture you would ask, how the questions about norms might change, and what you would actually believe the common values are. Now, I've asked you to just go through that exercise because that's what so many of our students are experiencing. And that isn't just newcomers to Canada, that, that's any student that comes from a racialized background. So what I'm here to do today is to talk about the need to amplify the student voice by providing more of the same race role model. Sarah, I'm gonna get you to go to the next one. So taking a look at this quote, the role model effect seems to show that having one teacher of the same race is enough to give a student the ambition to achieve. Now, this is really important because at the core, we are actually seeing an absence of the same race role model in our classrooms in Alberta. And this is in and of itself uh, lending to the problem of not seeing more black teachers at the front of the classroom. For myself, I've been in education for about 20 years. And in that time, I have never been taught by a black teacher. As a matter of fact, my education carries to the graduate level and I have never had a leader or instructor that was black. My professional experience has afforded me the opportunity to work with two other black educators, one at Lillian Osborne. Um, and of those, one was, a, uh, of those, uh, there was only one that was an administrator. And fortunately it was a female. So I was very uh, fortunate to have that experience. We'll jump over to the next slide. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, data. The challenge that we have had is that we have very little data collected in Canada to support our understanding of the diversity gap in education. So I'm gonna show you a sample um, of uh, questions that I ran with the uh, BTA to try and collect a little bit of, um, a little bit of data uh, from a, this, I guess would be a quantitative perspective, but um, a lot of this um, data is supported by our anecdotal conversations. So if you take a look at this slide, it's asking um, which category of K-12 schooling has presented you with a black teacher? And amongst our group, 84% of us have said that we've never had the experience of being taught by a black educator. So um, if you think about your students uh, and you think about what that experience will be like in the visualization I just carried you through, what would it be like when you're questioning them about things like values, norms, uh, expectations that we have in society when there's a little bit of a tension between what their understanding of culture and norms are at home compared to that that they see by educators that are not of the same race? We'll go to the next slide. We talked a little bit in our group about who inspired us most to become a teacher. And if you take a look, you can say, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of a close split, but there are more black teachers that said they were inspired by people other than educators to move into this profession than otherwise. So what I'm gonna share with you is my experience with this. I was not inspired to become a teacher by an educator. However, um, I was inspired by something an educator said. Uh, when I was going to school in the woods uh, at Holy Family and at Holy Trinity, I was uh, commonly <laughs> spending a lot of time out in the hallway. Uh, I got booted out of class quite often for just talking too much. And as I was getting ready to leave junior high and go on to uh, Holy Trinity, a school counselor calls me into his office and he said, you know, whatever you do, Gail, don't stop talking. Now that didn't translate into education. All it did was just tell me that somebody actually noticed that I had a skill and I was really I, was, I didn't actually know how to process that. So uh, I kind of put it away and I thought, well, I'll go on to do other things. But I wonder what would have happened if there was one teacher that said, use that 
to actually go to the front of the classroom. That would have been really special. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, uh, this question was reflecting on your former K-12 teachers, which subject area teacher would you most emulate in your role as an educator today? And our respondents, 56% of our respondents said that they actually emulate a core subject teacher that they had. So this means that for us as educators and for your students, they're watching you and they are looking for that encouragement from you. Consider if you are a core teacher teaching math or science, consider inspiring one of your students, finding that nugget that was found with me by my school counselor, find that nugget and inspire them. Talk to them about the gifts that they actually have and encourage them to actually move into the front of the classroom or move towards the front of the classroom. Hey, okay, let's jump to the next slide. So overall, what we're seeing is that there's a lack of interest in the profession. If we take a look at this slide here, it's actually talking about the top 10 intended professions. And you're gonna see that uh, down near the bottom is where we've got education. Education is ranked at 5% of interest. Now this is actually telling us that we have an overall problem with getting people to move into the profession, but it's really compounded when students actually don't see themselves uh, taking a place um, in the front of the classroom, uh, seeing themselves as administrators, or even moving into positions of uh, school trustees or superintendents. So we really are finding that uh, when students don't see themselves, they're not going to see themselves teaching. Okay, next one. Thanks. So what you're going to notice here is uh, some information that I was able to collect. This is um, a little bit of the data that we have in Canada. And I'm going to draw your attention to the far right hand, uh, second to last far right hand column, which is uh, talking about the teacher diversity gap. And this is uh, what we see in Ontario. Now these statistics are from North America, but these were the only ones that we could actually find coming out of Canada. And if you take a look at uh, what we've got on the side, we're seeing that in Ontario, we have a quarter of the population made up of racial minorities, but only 10% of those are teachers that are instructing them at the post second or at the secondary and elementary levels. So taking a look at how we would look in Toronto at the racial representation where we see 40%, 47% of the population um, is made up of uh, what is considered minorities, yet only 20% of those are teachers. So we're seeing a, a huge disproportionate, um, it's represented disproportionately where we're seeing uh, a large number of students not being taught by teachers that they see themselves resembling. We'll go to the next slide. All right, so um, this is uh, a little information on where we're at within our province. And so um, in having a really awesome um, like conversation back and forth with Dr. Jennifer Tupper, who's the Dean of the Faculty of Education, there was a few things that she shared with me that I thought would be really, really important for you to take away. And this would be uh, what's going on at that level. So we've got the Black Graduate Students Collective, and they've actually had a call to action to increase the number of Black students in the faculty across all programs. So starting at that level, we're actually seeing some really positive things happening. But you know what we're also looking at is who's forming these groups. Um, the Black students there are doing that. And that's very similar to what you see with the BTA. This is a grassroots coalition. And it would be far more impactful if we were actually seeing this from a top-down model, where it started with government, then moved into, uh, into our boards, and then actually trickled down. That said, um, we are still seeing some action. So while the university is in the same uh, places I mentioned before, where they're not collecting a lot of data on the number of Black students that are admitted, uh, there is a lot of work that's being acknowledged needs to be done. So, in terms of the Faculty of Education um, that uh, Dr. Tupper talked about the need to help and to create better partnerships within school divisions to promote uh, a career in education for Black students. So let's jump over to the next slide. All right, so um, the commitment that we're seeing from a couple of faculties within uh, 
within the U of A is the Faculty of Nursing is offering a mentorship program that partners um, with schools to actually bring Black students into, um, you know, kind of a, a practical, to get a practical view of what nursing would be. And we're also seeing that in the Faculty of Engineering. So if we are indeed committed to advancing racial justice and teaching for a better world and truly honoring the diversity of our students and their experiences, then we see that we have to work with the intent to broaden the participation of Black students in, te in the teaching profession by helping to see themselves reflected in the curriculum and actively challenge racial injustice in our schools. And so, as you can see, uh, this is a quote by Dr. Tupper. I'm gonna get you to just go to the next slide. Um, I want to uh, just kind of talk a little bit about how this actually kind of plays out. Um, as I've mentioned, Alberta has a disproportionate absence to black teachers, and this is across all levels of education. Uh, we recognize that this is actually viewed through low enrollment in the study of education, and this is provincially and nationally, and that we have to continue to attract black students to the profession by intentionally identifying those promising students uh, so that uh, the future, so that future students of color see themselves in the front of the classroom. We recognize that racialized students shouldn't be encouraged or recognize that racialized students should be encouraged to enroll in education faculties and to study in graduate programs because we need to have those students, not just in the role of teacher, but also students in the role of uh, researchers collecting and assessing data to find solutions for the gap in black teacher recruitment. We need to recognize this as an institutional crisis. We need to acknowledge that all levels of government need to actually participate in getting more teachers hired, retained, and advanced in the profession of education. And we need to amplify those voices so that Black students can actually see themselves. Now, there's one other point here that I'm just going to add, which is the importance of the role of the teacher right now. And that's where you are and why you're here. We recognize you're here because you already know so much of this information, but part of why we're here is to challenge how you think about it. And so what I'm going to leave you with is uh, questioning where your pedagogical understanding of teaching uh, to your black students and teaching um, items related to black culture, black diversity sits. So if you are considering yourself an ally, if you consider yourself somebody who is able to um, try and advance these conversations, challenge yourself first on what your starting point is, what your internal biases are, and how you're delivering some of that material to those students. Because although we need to see more of the same race role model, it needs to be authentic. And we have to ensure that we don't have teachers that are actually coming into the role of saviorism, and attempting to actually take an authentic experience away from our Black students by trying to uh, comfort them through some of the things that can be challenging. So I'm going to leave you with that um, and just ask you as a takeaway to look in your classes, not just when you return to school on Monday, but continue to look at your students and ask yourself if there is something that you can say to some of your students, to a single student, to inspire them to see something magical in themselves that will ultimately put them in the front of the classroom. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you all for, for coming to listen today. I just, first of all, wanted to give a shout out to, to the other four people on the panel. So I'm, I'm the one member from Calgary here um, and they've been so incredible with the work that's been done um, up in Edmonton uh, to get this going. Um, and though, I, though I'm, you know, three hours away from everybody. I felt that we've built a little family here. I have so much respect for everybody um, that's been grinding through this. So my name is Matt Sawyer. Uh, I teach uh, high school English down in Calgary. I've been teaching with Calgary Catholic for the past 13 years. My first seven years of my, of my teaching experience, I worked in a school that was lower socioeconomic um, and from a very diverse neighborhood. Uh, there are a, a huge Sudanese population in my school and a huge Filipino population. Uh, the last six years I've spent at a completely different school, uh, higher socioeconomic, and the school that I'm currently at, uh, St. Francis, at one point, you know, was predominantly white and, and Italian. And over the, 
years, the demographic of the school is changing, much like the demographic of Calgary, and I'm sure Edmonton is changing, where there is becoming more diversity in different neighborhoods. And so what's interesting about this school is over the last six years, I've even seen an increase. And while we have approximately 200, 300 black students and 250 black students in our building, a lot of our staff, though, actually are graduates from here, and, and they've never seen diversity in the classroom uh, or seen very little. And so there's been a lot of, uh, I don't know, tension, misunderstanding of how to work with uh, a diverse population. Um, I've always prided myself of building strong relationships with students, uh, with people. That's the key to life is building strong relationships. And I remain in contact with a lot of my students uh, beyond their years at, at the school. And through that time, I've experienced so many success stories. I hear of students, black students, going on to be successful in education, to finding jobs and careers, to sports and the arts. But unfortunately, um, I've heard a lot of tragedy from our black students surrounding my our black alumni, specifically black males. I've been to far too many students' funerals uh, in the past 13 years. And the vast majority of those students are black males. And so if we could flip the slide, I ask you all to think about whether you're in high school or not, is, is a diploma enough? It's a simple question, is a diploma enough? We work so hard and our students work so hard to, to achieve a diploma, to you know, end their, their, edu their educational career, this, this stage of it at least, to get that diploma and to walk that stage. And sometimes it takes some dragging, <laughs> sometimes it takes some additional and extra support. Uh, but there's always a buy-in from those students. And when they, when they walk that stage um, and when they, they graduate, we celebrate them and we should celebrate them. It's an incredible accomplishment. We know that a lot of our black students are, have uh, various obstacles at, at home. Some of them um, are new immigrants working, uh, you know, whether they're the, the breadwinner in the house at times or they're helping support looking after uh, family members. We know that there's a lot of there are a lot of obstacles and roadblocks for a lot of our students, and and these are the the reasons why sometimes graduating is is a challenge and then should be celebrated. But when July first hits, and they have that diploma, we kind of dust our hands off and and realize and send them off into the world and and hope and hope that they'll be fine. The reality is a lot of our students when they leave our our buildings are are lost. They're lost and. They don't know what to do. When they're in our buildings, they've developed a level of trust and security within the education system. They believe in a teacher or two or in a school. My former school was called Father Lacombe and the kids all said Lacombe is home. And those kids would never leave. <laughs> if the doors were open, they were in the hallways. But July 1st hits and we shut the doors and they don't know what to do, they're lost. If we could flip the next slide, please. Uh, too often we hear that this is an American issue, that uh, it's an American issue, right? That it's not as big of a, in, in, an issue or a problem in Canada. But if you take a look at these next few slides, um, black women and men in Calgary and Edmonton are one and a half and two times more likely to be unemployed than the rest of the population. And we're talking ages 25 to 59. Look at the next. The incarceration rate of the Black and Indigenous population is, is scary in federal prisons. There's a huge overrepresentation of the Black and Indigenous communities compared to the community, uh, to the Black and Indigenous uh, communities in not incarcerated. And if I could take the next slide. And possibly most scary for me was seeing the median annual wage gap between the Black and non Black workers, 25 to 59 in Canada where we see non-black males approximately $55,000 a year and black women approximately $35,000 a year. So if I could next slide. So knowing that this is the world that our students are going into, knowing that they have obstacles already uh, and knowing that a diploma truthfully isn't enough, what are we doing to help connect our students to the community to support them beyond our walls such that they achieve levels of success. Schools are safe spaces for our students and teachers are safe safety nets for our students. And they often trust somebody in the building, but not necessarily people in the community. And so as educators, we need to start working on bridging the gap between school and the community so that 
our students can develop levels of trust with people in the community. I'm, I, I, I coach club basketball as well. I'm involved in sports in the community. And I know that our students oftentimes do have somebody in the community via extracurricular activities that they trust. But the reality is a lot of those programs end when they turn 18. And a lot of those programs end coinciding when school is over and they have nobody left um, to, to, to reach, to, to, to lean on. And so as educators in an education system, we have to help develop that, that safety net for them and connect so that we can all work with these students. Um, ultimately, are we really listening to our students and addressing their needs? We hear them, but are we listening? Do we, do we understand what's really going on and how we can help best support them? If I could flip the slide, please. So we need to connect with more organizations in, this commu in the community, with sports and clubs. As a, as a school, we need to connect with them and as teachers. We need to bring these community organizations into our schools. And we need to show our students, our black students, that there is a huge group, a huge population out there that wants to help and support them. We need to bring back alumni into the building to speak with students and develop relationships. This school my, has a strong alumni um, presence. Alumni come into the school and are invited to the school all the time, but rarely, if ever, is a Black alumni invited in. Black alumni need to be here so that the students can see successful Black alumni and connect with them and develop relationships with them so that they can feel comfortable entering, quote unquote, the real world. Oftentimes we see this happen during Black History Month, which is incredible. But then again, when March 1st hits, we kind of, as school systems, we say, okay, we've done Black History Month and let's move on. And we need to continue this throughout. Uh, I spoke, I've spoken heavily with our work experience pro, uh, teachers within our school district. Um, in this school alone, there's 1,700 students, and there are zero students, Black students, in the work experience and or RAP program. Zero of 1,700. There are 250-ish Black students, and zero of them are in the work experience program. A lot of it is because the students don't understand what it's about. A lot of it is because there's a, uh, a misunderstanding with parents. The liaison that we spoke about earlier would be a great tool to help connect families with the school to build, help to build that trust and that network. For the work experience program, uh, we should be calling in some black owned businesses and have black owned businesses work within our work experience programs with our students. Our students would feel far more comfortable and safe uh, working in black owned businesses and black owned businesses would love black youth, uh, an infusion of black youth into their businesses. And so we should be connecting with these companies because oftentimes, as Gail said, when there's the one black student in the class, they're, they're that same one black student who's working at insert company name and they don't see themselves in it. And so we need to do a better job of networking with the community so that our kids are successful beyond. We need to really listen to them and amplify their voices. Uh, and now Mr. Powell, take it away. Great, thanks Matt. Thank you to everyone for being here. It's great to be with you. Um, I would like to give thanks and praise to the Most High. Um, this morning, I, I heard something, on, um, a little piece from J.D. Bracco on CBC about what's going on over there. 13 students read a poem that was inspired by the rapper Nas. And um, many of you, some of you might know this song. I know I can be what I wanna be. If I were to work hard at it, I'd be where I wanna be. It is an awesome, awesome song that I think that on Monday morning, each one of you that's listening right now, and you should spread the word because it's a song, it's a rap song for everyone. The fact is that those students from um, J.D. Bracco, they, they did a poem and 13 students read the poem. So 
just giving a shout out to what's going on over there, JD Bracco, because um, the first line of the poem that was read by a little, a young one of the girls said, I was made to feel inferior, which leads me into the 1963 speech of the, of his Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia to the United Nations. An excerpt of, of, of that speech was taken by Bob Marley, the Honorable Robert Nestor Marley and made into a song called War. That until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned. That until they're no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation, that until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes. That until the basic human rights is equally guaranteed to all without regard to race. That until that day, the dream of lasting peace, world citizenship, rule of international morality will remain but a fleeting illusion to be pursued but never attained. My fellow panelists and myself, oh, before I go into that, also, how could I forget? I wanna give a shout out to six teachers, uh, Harry Ainley, who have done a, an amazing job with about 30 students over there to, for the project that they did every day during the month of February to celebrate Black History Month. The teachers were facilitators. The students did all the work. They highlighted Black uh, achievements. There was a fact a day. They had a, a, a uh, what's the thing, Kahoot? So it was awesome. And, you know, I, I, um, I, I was so proud of the group at Harry Ailey. And thank you very much for doing that. We, as a group here, have acknowledged that there's a systemic problem within our school district. So we have made a conscious decision to make a difference. And once there is some form of acknowledgement and you get involved, then you begin to see things differently. It's not about us. It's about students in our community. It's about the next generation. Um, we, we are standing on the shoulders of the giants that came before us. Viola Desmond, Malcolm X, Jackie Roosevelt Robinson, Martin Luther King Jr., just to name a few. We're also inspired by the achievements of current giants like LeBron James, Amanda Gorman, Nicholas Andre Johnson, a Canadian from Montreal, the first black valedictorian at Princeton University in 274 years. I have worked with the Edmonton Public School Board for 38 years, 35 as a full-time teacher, and the past three and a half years as a substitute teacher because I retired in 2017. My career with the school board 
has been great. I have many good friends. Um, there's at least one or two out there listening to me right now. Many lifelong relationships with staff and students. However, there were instances, a few, when I had to deal with racial slurs, racial jokes, being treated differently, you know, and things of that nature. From my very first year of teaching, actually, before I was hired by Edmonton Public School Board, there was an incident that I still remember. So perhaps you will indulge me a, a, a brief story. Uh, I got into welding when I came to Canada as a visitor. And um, I went for an interview with the immigration. And the immigration officer said to me, um, <clears throat> you are going to be a burden to the Canadian government. This, now, now th this dude didn't know anything about me. All I wanted to do was get to Ryerson's Polytechnic Institute on Gold Street. And he told me that I was gonna be a burden to the Canadian government, so I should go back to Jamaica. Of course, I didn't listen to him. And a few years later, I came out to Alberta as a welder. I was working up in Fort McMurray for a while, but before I got to Fort McMurray, I went to Vic and completed my matric to get into the University of Alberta. My goal now is to get into the University of Alberta. So I took six, uh, six courses, departmentals they were called, all three sciences, chemistry, biology, physics, English 30, math 30, and math 31. I applied to the university to, in science with dreams of becoming a doctor. But then while I was on campus in Central Academic, having one of their lovely, I don't know if they still make them over there, cinnamon buns, this guy saw me and he said, hey, aren't you a welder? I said, yes. He said, um, do you know that the government of Alberta is paying guys like you to become a teacher? Because I had a journeyman certificate and I got up and raced over to the Faculty of Education and got into this program. The government was paying $6,000 a year. So $12,000 for two years. On top of that, the Edmonton Public School Board was paying an extra $3,000 if you signed with them. I had an interview. I went for my interview and the dude that was doling out the money, whose name I won't tell you, but I have it. He said to me, there is no more money left. But we're a cohort on campus. And I talked to, we were talking one day and I knew some people that went after me. And guess what? They got the money, but I didn't. It's kind of like when Lazarus was trying to get an apartment, a friend of mine from Jamaica, and he, there was an, uh, a vacancy and he called. And when he got there, they said there was no vacancy. Anyhow, that didn't deter me, you know, from going on to becoming a teacher. And by the way, when I graduated in 1982, there were two jobs with the Edmonton Public School Board and only one guy myself graduating from the welding department. It was with a welding uh, uh, degree anyway. I continue to be a presence in the school system, to be a role model for all students, especially those in the black community. When I was hired at Harry Ailey by George P. Nicholson in 1986, he looked me in the eye and he said, I need you to be a role model for the young black men in the school. 
There's Jeff Bereef, who sadly passed away a few years ago. Fitz Gordon, who is now a principal in Ontario. Oral Ogilvy, Ray Hawkins. I don't know where Ray Hawkins is. And several others. And it turned out, in fact, there were kids from Lazert that knew me. Gentles, Eddie Joseph, all those guys. Guys from Shep. Guys from JP. You know, when I showed up at uh, track meets or basketball games, you know, they, I mean, they, I, I knew their parents. And I've embraced that role as a role model ever since. And I'm, it's so good to see these, uh, my young panelists doing the same thing because they know the importance of being out there. I've watched the um, Edmonton. The city of Edmonton and the surrounding areas become more and more diverse over the years. And subsequently, uh, the student population as well. Unfortunately, however, our administration and our teaching staff have not fully reflected that change. And as Gail mentioned, for a variety of reasons, not enough students going to the faculty of education, black teachers having difficulty getting hired and are so frustrated that some of them leave the profession. How can we change this narrative? What do I need to do to be supportive of all students of color? How do we move forward without taking a step back? I think as we've done, uh, one has to make a conscious, a conscious decision to make a difference. Start with the person in the mirror. You know, I mean, the master, Michael Jackson, told us a long time ago, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his way. Understand that the choices that we make now have lifelong consequences. And what we do or what we don't do affect everything else. There are a lot of us that are trying to help or trying to change the narrative, but you know, we have to do better. What strategies can I use to make a difference? For example, um, we talked about, I mean, Gail found out how she got into, by just being told that she should keep on talking. It ju that just took a second. I could say to a student, have you ever considered being a teacher? That's a statement. It might become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think you'd be a great teacher. So if we stress the importance on a one-to-one -one basis. The importance of a rep uh, representation, the impact that we have on lives. Make a personal commitment, which I have. In some form to self-educate yourself, you know, and I read simple books. I read simple books. I read children's books. Why? because children's books are written by adults. And they know what they're talking, they know what the message that they're trying to send. For example, check this little book out. It's called Anti-Racist Baby. And you know, it's simple, it's a board book. It's a board book. And so I'll just read the first little line. Anti-racist baby is bred, not born. Anti-racist baby is raised to make society reform. It's got nine steps in it, simple. We understand. And if we follow those nine steps, we can make a difference. You know, I mean, the, the Congressman John Lewis talked about legacy, leaving a legacy. What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? 
because every generation leaves a legacy. And we're, we're trying to leave a positive legacy for the next generation. We cannot remain silent. You know, I mean, like if we, uh, the, the poem, the poet rather, um, Dante Alighieri, the Italian poet, and he's endorsed by Martin Luther King in the statement, the hottest place in hell is reserved for those who remain silent in times of social unrest. We can shape our own legacy or let events like this past summer and what's going on in our schools right now shape it for us. It's easy to talk about race when there are moments of challenge and controversy, when we cannot look away and we're forced to do something. But sometimes that new awareness that arises quickly fades away because there's no action. So along with our allies, we want to continue to advocate for understanding and fundamental change for students and teachers in the Black community. We will continue to work in positive ways to improve student achieve, achievement and graduation rates, but not, not only to graduate, but to graduate with confidence and empowerment to rise up Amanda Gorman, poet laureate, youngest inaugural poet. Her words, there's always a light if we only are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. We certainly don't want the tireless efforts of those shining the light to be wasted and those that have shunned the lights before us to be wasted. We want to continue. I want to be a light for Black students, for all students, but especially Black students in our community because they need, they're crying, they're crying out to us. And I'm so happy that Sarah and Andrew came up with this idea. And we are glad that we can jump because we don't want to be silent. They're, they're taking risks. I am retired. I am retired. I'm a substitute teacher. I remember substitute my, one of my first jobs when I, when I substitute at, uh, at JD Bracco. And when I walk into any classroom, they're getting a rap because that's how I introduce myself. Well, my name is Mr. Powell and I'd like you to know I'm the number one teacher to rap on the show. It's English time in this school, you see. So listen all your students and everybody, you won't pay to come see me, I'll rap for free. Cause when I'm in the spirit, I don't need money. One of a kind, shock your mind. So when you come to school to try to be real cool, they get that and then I own them. But then they say to me, hey, you should be at our school, kind of thing. And so um, we need simply more people that look like us representing us. I'm E. Patrick Powell, and it's been great to be with you. Enjoy our virtual convention. But before you go, before you go, we have time for questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thanks oh, everybody. Go ahead, Dan. I'm just going to quickly share a couple um, uh, informative closing slides and then we'll get to the, the Q&A. So uh, it's, al it's always amazing to listen to you folks speak and share. And it's also been, uh, 
a very interesting to follow the chat. Uh, there's lots of questions to discuss and lots, uh, lots of knowledge about uh, meritocracy and uh, the building of the pyramids and things. So it's, it's nice to always have you folks speak because you bring a, a very, uh, very interesting and very uh, intelligent crowd with you. Uh, and I look forward to spending time with you this afternoon, asking and answering some of your questions. Um, I will just point out this session will be recorded. Um, a version of the session has already actually been um, recorded and is available as, as part of a, an ongoing anti-racism and anti-oppression speaker series that the ATA is putting on this year. And you can find that uh, those previous recordings at that website. And I'll put that, uh, that link in the chat uh, at the very end of our session here. What you want to do is go to that link and then click on anti-racism and then all of the recordings will show up. Uh, a very similar thing is uh, is in place on your Getka SCED site. If you want to look at all of the recorded and uh, recorded sites, just find the filter that says recording. Uh, but there is um, actually five, uh, five speakers in this series, including Farah Sharif, who spoke just before we started. Uh, the ATA is always building out um, resources for teachers and school leaders uh, around anti-racism. So uh, there's a library guide page, a lib guide page on anti-racism uh, that includes books that we have in the library that we'll send to you for free, uh, that you send back for free. Um, there's curated videos, lesson plans, things like that. So if you have any ideas about resources to add to that, um, you can share those with me directly and I'll include my email uh, in the chat. Uh, I just found out this morning uh, uh, about this, uh, this research that we're doing um, focused on uh, female uh, teachers and school leaders and their lived experiences during the, the pandemic. Uh, and in particular for this focus group, um, the, our researcher has uh, identified that um, predominantly um, uh, white teachers have signed up to participate. So if there's anyone um, in this uh, conversation or any of the panelists who'd like to be involved with this focus group, um, you can contact Lisa and we'd love to have your perspective uh, to, to help inform this research and make it more, um, uh, more representative of our teaching population. And I'll put Lisa's information in the chat as well. Uh, we do offer a grant program uh, through the Diversity, Equity, and Human Rights um, uh, work of the association. Uh, $2,000 is available for school-based projects to make uh, um, school communities uh, uh, more uh, more socially just, more uh, racially just, more equitably equitable. There's there's any number of projects can be supported by this, but if you are motivated by the sorts of things that you're hearing at teachers conventions this year, and you start starting to have some plans for next year and you just need some money, um, then uh, you can email me and I will send you a copy of this um, application information, but please, please take us up on that. Uh, and then finally, my last, my last slide before we get to the Q&A is uh, you can follow uh, the ATA PD uh, department on all of these social media channels to find out about upcoming speakers in that anti-racism series or anything else we've got in the works. Okay, and with that, I'm going to end the old recording and we'll get to some Q&A. <laughs>